Hey everybody, Tommy and Eddie the Skid Guys here. Wanted to give you a warning, kind of like a red flare if you will. Church is about to start in three minutes. Hey, hey, I found that verse I was telling you about that I think would be perfect for this morning. Nay, 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 right now I am doing the service countdown, trying to get everybody ready for church. Oh, sorry, sorry everybody. Uh, hang on just a second. No, I really would like to read this no, passage. No, you from... hang on. I'm trying to equip what? them and empower them to be ready for church, all right? Hey, with that, uh, it's time to uh, finish up the coffee and go ahead and let's guzzle that some of those donuts, all right? Coffee donuts, I got a donut, don't mind if I do, all right? Mm. Go ahead and finish up conversations, okay? Any type of conversation that you have me get done, all right? Nobody understands what you're saying. There you go, no, there you go. No, they there don't, you go. it makes also, no sense. Also, breath mints, if you got a breath mint, take it now so you can talk to people, maybe your visitors, you don't know, right? What? Breath mint, breath mint. No, I don't know what you said, but here you need my things. Mm. Now, back to this, okay? Hmm. Before that, this. All the generation X, Y, and Zers, get out those Bible apps. Oh, or, or, just do what the greatest generation did and actually bring a Bible to church. Just saying. Which brings me back to the Bible. The passage Before I wanted that, to I thought though we could do a little trivia. While we're all just sitting here wasting some time, I did some trivia on my little iPad here. Okay. Let's see what we can do. Okay, okay, okay. I do love trivia. Okay, okay all right. Okay, see go. if you know the answer to this question. Here we go. Wait, that's that's your question? That's my question. That is a Bush League question. What? No, it's that a good... That is pathetic. What? Oh, here, look, treat me. Okay, if you want a real good question, try this one. <laughs> Did you just make that up on the spot? Uh, the answer is hunting license. Hunting license. The answer to my question was 26. There are 26 letters in the German alphabet. Yeah, nobody cares because that's a pathetic trivia question. It's a great Here's another one. one. Try this one. That's not even a question. <laughs> I know. But can you imagine when the pastor walks in and everybody's trying to lick their elbows? <laughs> no. No, 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 no. Finish your coffee. Finish okay. your coffee. Here. Okay. okay. Now it's time for what I like to call Bible. Trivia! Answer that question, friends. Hey, friend. Um, you said you had some scripture, and before time runs out, this may be a really good time for you to share the scripture that huh? you had. Before time runs out, did you want to share some of your scripture? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. Because uh, we don't want time to run out, do we? Nope, nope, no. nope. Where was that? Because, you know, there's only so many seconds left. Would you stop talking? Okay? Right, I'm just trying You're to... distracting me. I thought you'd have it memorized Shh, by now. quit talking, okay? okay? I'm trying to find it. I forgot where it was, okay. and I'm going to find it. Okay. Hold on. Yeah, go ahead. It was in... Find uh, it. Let's oh, see what you found got. it. Got it, okay. okay. Time's up. No, no, no! Good morning, Venture. I'm so glad that you're watching with us today. We're going to pray before we go into the worship. God, you are so many things. You are powerful and you are great. You're kind. You're our Father. But most of all, you are our number one supporter. And in times of trial and in times of pain, that you are there for us and you fight that battle alongside with us. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the wonderful day that you've made today. And thank you for the wonderful days that you make in the future. I ask that you bless this worship. I ask that you bless the sermon. I pray for the health of our church, and I pray for the health of our nation. Amen.
I see the work of your hands Galaxies spinning a heavenly dance Oh God, all that you've done is so overwhelming I hear the sound of your voice All that wants it's a gentle and thundering Good morning and welcome to Venture Church. My name's Pastor Joel, and I'm thrilled that you would make the decision to join us for worship this day. We're back from a two-week break. We sure missed you, and sorry we weren't here for you, but our video director had a pretty serious health condition. He's doing better, and he's back at it again. We're, we're so grateful for that. And we pray for you as well, that you're doing well and staying strong in these difficult and challenging days. 
Well, we're in the midst of a series this month called Against the Grain. The title of our message for today is On the Level. Now, most everything I learned about carpentry it began in the seventh grade shop class. Mr. Jepson, he taught us that there are two ways to cut wood, with the grain or against the grain. In fact, I still have that very first shop project that I made in his class. Surprisingly, Gretchen keeps it on the counter of our kitchen. The Sermon on the Mount is, is Jesus' challenge to us to live life on the level, which is an expression for a life of integrity, a life of honesty, a life of truthfulness, unlike the world. Well, how does the world live? Well, the world lies. Many years ago, a a gentleman named Robert Feldman, let me share this quote with you. In a 2002 study by the University of Massachusetts psychologist Robert Feldman, he discovered that 60% of the people tested lied at least once during a 10-minute conversation, and most told an average of two to three lies. Now, that's a shocking statistic, but I can only imagine what the numbers would be today if a similar test were done. You know, one of my favorite stories from my youth centered around what I would call a great big fat lie. I was an Iowa farm kid. I don't expect you to even know what this is, but we were one day shelling corn at a neighbor's house. And on that day, there were two old bachelor brothers there. They were named Manuel and Daniel. Now, during one of the breaks, they proceeded to tell us, tell us boys who were there working, to tell us about a recent event in their life. They told us they, they had been up flying in a small airplane with a friend of theirs. And they found themselves flying low and through a very dense and thick fog, so dense that you couldn't see the hand in front of your face. And they said as they were flying through this dense fog, all of a sudden there was a terrible crashing sound. And all at once the plane came to a stop, to a standstill, in midair. And as they got their bearings, they discovered that the plane had flown between two very narrow rocky cliffs and literally got wedged between the rocks, and there they hung in midair. Well, there was much more to the story, but all I can say to you is that our young eyes were as big as saucers as we imagined this plane stuck in midair. The the funny part of the story was, I believed every word of it. But what was really funny about the story, that it was many, many years later. I must have been 20 years old, 19 or 20 years old. And one day I stopped and I thought to myself, wait a minute, that couldn't have happened. I just realized that I'd been a victim of a great, big, whopping lie. (laughs) Culture is good at that. Culture has all kinds of names for the lies that we tell. White lies, little lies, fibs, whoppers, blatant exaggerations. But but at the end of the day, whatever you call a lie, it's still a lie. But I asked myself the question this week as I was studying, and I thought, why is it that people lie? Why do you lie? Why do I lie? What, what drives us to that? And I thought of five. There, there would be many, many more. But let me quickly kind of challenge you with five reasons why we lie. Number one, we do it to escape punishment. We don't want to get caught, and so we lie. Number two, we're trying to be polite. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, so we lie. Number three, we do it for pure gain, monetary benefits. We tell people what they want to hear so we can extract something from them. Number four, we do it to avoid shame. Did you finish your test? Did you read the assignment? Did you do what I asked you to do? Oh, well, rather than avoid, than experience the shame, 
we lie. Number five, maybe the number one reason why people lie is because we lack motivation. We, we lack an understanding of the, the reason to, to do the hard work and tell the truth. Well, this morning, I want to take you on a journey into the Sermon on the Mount. And I want you to hear Jesus' amazing words of truth, the amazing motivation that he gives us today to be men and women of truth. In fact, you could summarize everything Jesus says by simply this, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He's telling us to be people of truth. He's telling us to be honest. He's saying to us, don't lie. So so let's read the passage of Scripture. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Here's what Jesus said to the crowd that day. He said, again, you have heard it said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but rather fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, don't swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And don't swear by your head, for you can't even make one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, if you're going to understand the passage, I think we need to dig a little deeper into the context and into the culture, into the practice of the people that day. You'd have to understand this business of oath-taking. See, it was understood in Jesus' day that an oath was a way to communicate a stronger commitment to say, I will do what I said I will do. I will keep my word. It was almost like a little game we would play to try to convince you that this time I really am going to keep my word. I promise. Let me give you an example. For instance, if if I wanted to borrow your plow, I would go to my neighbor and I would promise I'll have it back to you by Tuesday. But he needs it on Wednesday. Life or death, he's got to, it's a life and death situation. He's got to have his plow back. And he's not sure that you'll bring it back in time. But to try to convince him, you make an oath. You swear an oath to him and you say, I promise you by the Lord God of heaven, by the Lord God of heaven and earth, by, by the city of Jerusalem and all that is sacred within the temple, I promise you, I will bring that plow back on Tuesday. Even swearing by your own head, Jesus would say, as if to say, if I don't return it to you, I promise you can have my head. It's a game. It was a little system that people were doing in that day, not unlike what we do here today. Don't we say the same kind of things? We, we make a promise. People don't believe us. So we take it to the next level and we say, hey, listen, I, I put my hand on a stack of Bibles. I cross my heart and I hope to die on my mother's grave. If I don't do what I say, I'll do. May the Lord strike me dead. Those are strong words. But you see, the whole problem is, your word is not enough, and so you have to, to have to support it. You have to strengthen it with some kind of massive consequence that will convince the person to take you at your word. We do it. We do it legally every day. Our word is not good enough, so what do we say? Would you put it in writing? Unless it's put in writing, no one takes it seriously. But you know what Jesus would, Jesus would say to all of this? He would say, nonsense. This is not the way my people, this is not the way my followers should be living your life. Jesus is saying to us, I want your word to mean something. If you say it, 
then you do it. I want your word to be your bond. Jesus captures this this simple expression and this idea of letting your yes be yes and letting your no mean no. In fact, if, if I could put it together for you in a very simple lesson or an expression, here's how I would tell you. Jesus is telling us that your word, if you're a Christian, your word doesn't have to be in writing because your word and your word alone should be enough. It should be enough. What, what would your life look like if, if you made a commitment to always and forever tell the truth? If you always did, if you knew that you would always do what you said you were going to do, life would change. I guarantee you we would we would pause and think before we made any promises. We would be careful what we committed ourselves to. We would never have to worry about remembering the details of a story, what we told somebody or what we said. But I think maybe the most important thing is you would sleep like a baby. So why is honesty such a big deal to the Lord? I mean, why does it matter all that much? Well, it's, it's rooted, honestly, as, as you read the character of God in the pages of Scripture, as you read the stories of Jesus and his statements, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. I am the truth. It's rooted in his very character. In fact, the Bible says, The Bible says that God cannot lie. Now, that's very different from saying God doesn't lie. It it means that it's in the very fabric of his nature. God is straight up. He's true. He's on the level. The Bible says that, that there is no shifting shadow. The songwriter said there's no shadow of turning. It means that he's unchanging, that his truth and his word is consistent and always and forever the same. So then when you and I become Christians, we become his sons and daughters. It would be then utterly inconsistent for us as his children who now bear his image and carry his spirit in our lives to be anything but on the level, just like our Father in heaven. You know, the world is always a better place because of people who tell the truth. Well, one great example of that was Abraham Lincoln. Long before he was called Mr. President, he was first called Honest Abe. The secret of the greatness of this man was the integrity of his word. He was a man of honesty. His his wife even reported the stories that that had been told about him. She she told the stories of him working as a young store clerk in New Salem, Illinois. Whenever Abraham Lincoln realized that someone had been shortchanged, a customer had, had been a miscalculation of just a few pennies, he would close the shop and he would deliver the correct change regardless of how far he had to walk. Abraham Lincoln was a world changer and it was rooted in the integrity of his truth. But but why did Abraham Lincoln tell the truth? Well, ultimately, it was because he knew that his life was accountable to God. So I went through Scripture, and I I, I looked for some some principles, some lessons in Scripture. I, I wanted to share some really important verses with you. Let me say four things to you about honesty and truthfulness and deception and 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 I, and let God speak to your heart. But the first thing I want to say to you from Scripture is this. Number one, God hates deception. God hates it. That's a strong word. Some might say, I didn't know God hated anything. Oh, he does. He hates lying. In Proverbs 12, 22, the Bible says, The Lord detests lying lips, 
but he delights in people who are truthful. So people who lie, it's an abomination to him. But people who seek truth bring joy and delight to his heart. Boy, that's an important truth to remember. When you're tempted to lie, I want you to think of your Father in heaven. Number two, it it really boils down to this. It's a daddy issue. A daddy issue. Now, what in the world do you mean by that? Well, in John chapter 8, verses 42, 42 through 47, Jesus is speaking to this group called the Pharisees. And he tells them something. He says some very strong words to them. And essentially, he says these words to him. He says, you are acting like your father, the devil, when you lie. You see, the devil was a liar and a murderer from the very beginning. And when you lie, you are like him. But, but the reverse is also true. When, when you choose to, to carry the courage, to express the courage of honesty and truthfulness, no matter the cost, you're like your father in heaven. See, it's really a daddy issue. Number three, You see, at the end of the day, all will be revealed. One reason people lie is because they're hiding. Sometimes they think, yes, I can get away with it. I can hide it. No one will ever know wrong. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36, he says that on the day of judgment, everyone, everyone, I guess that includes me, and you will have to give an account for every empty word that they have spoken. Strong words. It it inspires me, it motivates me, it challenges me to speak the truth. Finally, number four. The Bible teaches us that lying pays poorly. Poorly. The liars at the end of the day are always empty-handed. Well, maybe not money. Maybe they do get ahead sometimes. Maybe they do get filthy rich by their lying and their deception. But at the end of the day, it's all for nothing. The Bible says in Proverbs 21, 6, that a fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a deadly snare. You know, it's interesting to, to ponder It's an interesting question to reflect upon. At what price? What price your character? What price tag would you put on your conscience, your testimony, your peace of mind? Is is there a point, is there an event, is there a circumstance in your life in which you would say, for that I would lie? (laughs) Let me tell you a little story, an old story. Back in the day when... People traveled on trains. There was a a rule that kids under the age of five did not have to pay the fare. So one day, a mother and her six-year-old little boy were, were boarding the train. And the mother said to her son, she said, now when the conductor comes by and asks you your age, tell him you're only five and we won't have to pay. The little boy frowned. He knew it was wrong. But he got on the train, and when the conductor came by and asked, How old are you, little boy? He obediently said, I'm five years old. So he didn't have to pay. His mother paid the single fare, and she went on her way, and the conductor went on his way. Later on that train journey, the conductor made his way back through the aisles, And he stopped to chit-chat with the little boy, just some friendly conversation. And somewhere along the way, the conductor asked the little boy, so when are you going to be turning six? (laughs) This little fellow scratched his head and he said, I think about the time I get off the train. (laughs) What scenario would tempt you to lie? How about the difference between a passing grade and a failing grade? Did you finish that assignment? Would you have the courage to tell the truth no matter what, even if it cost you the grade? 
What about a boss who, who would ask you to lie to a customer? Tell them you're out of the office or give them an excuse why the product is not available. Would you lie to save a job? Would you lie to the insurance company if, if, it, if it meant the difference in thousands of dollars of claims that they would pay? But it would require a lie. Would you do it? Is there a price? Is there a price that would push you over the edge? Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that it would be better to be poor than to be a liar. I believe that with all of my heart. You know, I was searching. I'm a quote guy. I like to share quotes. And I always like to find a kind of a new, fresh quote. So I was searching, and as I was searching, I started to think about an old quote, one that, well... I'm sure everybody, certainly 50 years and above, all of us who grew up in that era have heard this quote before. I think it might be one of the most insightful and best quotes ever on the problem of lying. It was written by Sir Walter Scott, and he said, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. It's the trap. It's the web that we get ourselves caught into, the lies, the deception. One lie leads to another and another and another. But let me tell you if an old story from a gentleman named Paul Harvey. He told it many, many years ago. And it truly captures the danger and the disaster of deception and lying in our lives. The story goes, in 1899, four reporters were looking for a story on a Sunday night. Just for the fun of it, they decided to create a colossal whopper of their own. So that Monday morning, they sent news back to the home, their home newspaper, reporting that the Chinese government was tearing down the Great Wall. What an amazing story. Quite unexpectedly, the lie, the whopper, caught hold, and newspapers all across China began reporting it. And then it began to spread to other countries and throughout the world that the Chinese government was tearing down the Great Wall. Well, there was already a radical group at work within China, and when they heard this story, they took matters into their own hands, and they launched an internal attack, a a revolution, so to speak, They attacked foreign embassies. They they murdered ambassadors. They attacked Christian missionaries and murdered hundreds of Christian missionaries, not to mention the thousands of their own people. And it all sprang from one lie. What was the result? Was something that history calls the Boxer Rebellion. The Chinese government today is in power as a result of the Boxer Rebellion. And it all sprang from a lie. Interesting. What, where are the lies in your life? Who have you been lying to? What, what damage is it causing? What distress is it causing in your own heart? What, what excuses have you been making? Jesus' challenge to us is that we serve the God of heaven and earth, the God of truth, the God of integrity, the God of honesty. And Jesus calls us out of the darkness. He calls us to a life that is against the grain, a life that is on the level, straight and true, no matter the price, no matter the cost. Jesus would say, tell the truth. Be people of the truth. I wanted to lead you in a final prayer of commitment. And and I want to leave you with just a word of hope that God loves us and there's a fresh, brand new start for all of us. He understands our dilemma and He is ready to forgive us and to lift us up and to put us in a brand new place with a brand new beginning. Today could be the first day of your life 
a day when you walk with the Lord with integrity and honesty and truthfulness. If that's the desire of your heart, would you join me in this prayer? Let's bow our heads together. Almighty God, I honor you as the source of all truth. I believe that your truth will set me free. I confess the lies along with all the excuses that I've made for myself. I commit myself to being a person of truth. I will try with your help to let my yes mean yes and my no mean no. Thank you for showing me the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Lord bless you. I pray that you've been encouraged and challenged and motivated to walk with the Lord in brand new ways today. We're praying for you. We love you guys and looking forward to seeing you very soon. Have a blessed week.